Great. Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have such a, a big crowd for Richard's uh, memorial service. So I'd, I'd like to welcome you really on behalf of Richard's um, family. Um, so Emily and Peter here. And uh, um, there was a real kind of desire to have something where we got together to, to celebrate Richard's life, really. Um, and that was the, the kind of drive for, for, for doing this. Um, so we've organised it with Adam Hampshire and, uh, and Fatima, uh, with Margaret's help and Richard's family. Um, and thank you, Paul, for the support of the Division of Brain Sciences. So we're welcoming you all here um, uh, for that purpose. Um, so we were, as I say, keen to sort of get a, get a spectrum of uh, memories from Richard's life. So we've, we've organised a, a sequence of speakers really spanning through from Richard's um, early life with his brother all the way through to um, his more, more recent work. Um, so I hope it will be um, interesting and, uh, and it, we were hoping that it would be a celebration of, uh, of everything that Richard achieved really. Because um, he led a very um, full and uh, kind of exciting life really, full of joy and, uh, and love and, and I hope that I think that will be reflected in, the, um, uh, in what we're here today. Um, so this was, uh, I mean, most of you know this, but this was Richard's stamping ground. This is where we spent really his whole career, actually. Um, so he spent many years seeing patients on the wards, supporting the SBRs, kind of sorting out all of the, uh, uh, the problems at the Hammersmith, Hammersmith, while at the same time really pushing back the, the boundaries of, uh, uh, of neuroscience, Firstly, in the, in the cyclotron units, where there was tremendously exciting work that went on throughout the 80s and 90s, then moving over to the Burlington Danes um, building, where we've uh, um, continued um, the work there. Um, and we're going to hear some reflections about that. Um, so I, I met Richard, first of all, in the Cyclotron building, which is now the kind of nuclear wasteland just, uh, um, just over there. Um, I kind of pitched up having just finished an SHO job in cardiology here, which was an unpleasant experience. Um, and, uh, and, and I kind of uh, went to Richard's little office with his red, red sofa, sat down on the, on the famous red sofa to be interviewed. Um, and I think Richard asked me one or two questions, but then couldn't stop himself from just launching into kind of an excitement about the work he was doing with Sophie Scott with Alex, looking at streams of language processing and, uh, and really kind of pushing back the boundaries of our understanding of, of, of language. And then at some point, David Brooks kind of wandered in, uh, and that was the cue for the vodka martini shaker to come out, and, uh, um, and, there was, and, uh, and that was the end of the interview. Um, and, I, and, you know, I, I couldn't believe that this was, uh, this was how things worked, and, but it went on to be, you know, a continuation of that, just a really exciting, kind of friendly um, environment uh, that was uh, very conducive to good neuroscience. Um, so Richard was a great scientific leader, I think, um, and a mentor, but more, perhaps more importantly, he was a friend to um, lots of people that he came in contact with. He was uh, uh, a tremendously supportive, particularly of young scientists coming through. Um, and Pete Hellier um, set up a website that many of you will have seen. And there's a, a great testament, if you have a look through there, of the, um, the things that people have, uh, have written. I wanted to just read out one example, because um, for me it captured something about um, the Richard that I knew. Uh, this was from Guillaume Thierry, um, who's at Bangor. I don't think he's, uh, um, he's in the audience. Um, but he wrote, um, for me, um, the greatest people have two qualities. Um, they're clever and kind. Um, the world has plenty of smart bastards. Um, it also has many kind souls whose penny has seldom dropped. Uh, the latter seem to be steered by the former. Richard was amazingly clever. He was also kind, and he was one of them, one of the greatest. He understood and he cared. Um, and he did these things with touching discretion and immense grace. That he'll be missed is an understatement um, that one aches to write, let alone to say. Mind you, that makes sense. Richard's passing away, one feels, has shut you down for a good while, refraining to engage in the very act that he dedicated so much of his time to understand. Thank you, Richard. Um, and I, I, I kind of felt that that captured a little bit of Richard's, uh, um, Richard's grace and his kind of support and his kindness for people, which was uh, um, kind of obvious to, to, to many people. Um, he, um, he was also very unconventional, you know, which I think was one of his, uh, was one of his great strengths. Um, I remember once he went to an international conference and uh, had left things to the last minute and arrived without a poster. So he just got a big piece of paper, stuck it up on the, uh, on the poster board and proceeded to uh, just draw exactly what he wanted to on the, uh, on the poster board. And this was, you know, people loved it. They loved that kind of, uh, um, the fact that he was so engaged in them and he was so unconventional in his, in his approach. Um, 
So I think um, we're going to move on now um, to, to a, a sequence of the talks. But before that, um, I just wanted to um, mention that we um, have set up a, um, a, a memorial fund uh, for Richard. Uh, and this was really at uh, Richard's family's instigation. But what we wanted to do was to have something that would uh, um, be a, uh, a kind of ongoing memorial for Richard, really. Um, so this is um, a fund to support um, a lecture that will go on every year um, with the idea of supporting um, young scientists. So we'll pick a, a promising neuroscientist each year and also a more established neuroscientist. Um, and uh, what we're aiming for is to try and um, get 30,000 to make this sustainable sustainable. Um, if you um, would like to donate, you could text up to £20 here, or ideally go to the Just Giving website and give a lot more. Um, and if you know somebody very rich, tell them to, uh, tell them to uh, donate more. So I'll, we'll leave that up and I'll, I'll put it up at the end. Um, but let's, let's move on. Um, so we're going to start proceedings um, with Rich's brother, um, Philip Wise. Philip, Phil, would you like to come up? Um, and uh, Phil's going to tell us a bit about early, the early years, I think. Indeed. Well, this is yeah. the low-tech end of the market, so David is now going to rig me up with a mic just to show me how it's done properly. A pulse master. Am I audible? Excellent. Right. Well, good evening, everyone. Nice to be back at Imperial and to find that the air conditioning is working as well as I remember it working in the old days. <laughs> I think it was Voltaire who started the ball rolling with his aphorism that behind every great man there stands a surprised mother-in-law. And since then it's been purloined and adapted for many different occasions, including that favourite of wedding anniversary speeches, behind every great man there stands an astonished wife. So if other people can do it, why not me? And my variant is that behind every great man there stands an astonished older brother. <laughs> so what was it about Richard that astonished me? Well, th there are three anecdotes that come to mind that I think illustrate Richard both as a person and as a scientist. And I want to start back in 1982, which is a bit before some of your time, I know, but you need to know the history of Richard. And he rang me up one day to tell me that he'd got some real breakthrough results in the work that he was doing on brain meta metabolism in stroke-affected patients. And as he would have gathered as the conversation went on, uh, I had got enough information uh, to suggest the astonishing possibility that there might actually be some truth in what he was telling me. But as he could also tell, I wasn't wholly convinced. And so I was invited to review the evidence in proper scientific fashion. And as a result, I ended up one Saturday morning standing in the lab that David has just described in the old Cyclotron building. And I got to see the couch that patients lay on while they were being PET scanned. And Richard also pointed out the open tube where the radioactive oxygen came up from the Cyclotron. And I innocently asked, so, how do we turn that off? Oh no, I was told, that would upset the cyclotron arrangements. We can't do that. So I said, you mean there's radioactive oxygen coming out of that tube as we're standing here now? Oh yes, he said, but, uh, but don't worry, it won't do us any harm. So by the end of our session, I was astonished in two totally different ways. First of all, I was persuaded that his research work really did open the door to a major improvement in stroke outcomes if suitable ways could be found of restoring blood flow rapidly to the stroke-affected brain. But secondly, I was not in the least persuaded that breathing in radioactive oxygen for hours each day was harmless. So I'm just thankful I was never Richard's RPO. The second experience was about 10 years later, in 1992. Richard had decided that he needed some more controls for his latest paper. And he knew that I'd got about 250 people working for me in the city, who all claimed to be normal. And he rang me up one day and asked if he could enlist them for his study. 
And the deal we agreed was that I put a short note round describing both his work and the opportunity to hear him speak one evening in our offices after normal working hours. And we also agreed that I would stay away from the presentation so that there was no implicit pressure from me on people to attend. So I was pretty impressed to hear that 40 of my people had attended and absolutely astonished that over 30 of those had agreed to participate in the sheer tedium of a subsequent imaging session. When I asked him how he'd done it, he said, oh, well, I brought along a few bottles of wine so they could stay for a chat afterwards. And as he'd said they all thought they were pretty smart, I pointed out that every participant would be getting a free colour print of their brain in action that they could take home and show off to friends and family. Astonishment again. Free booze and an appeal to personal vanity. I felt I was really beginning to understand the sine qua non of modern science. The third and final story dates from about 15 years after that, and it was just after I'd started my PhD here. And I rang, rang Richard up and suggested we meet for lunch. And about 10 minutes before we were due to meet, he rang to ask whether I minded if he brought along various members of his lab as well. And um, well, I've always been a keen student of group dynamics, so I was quite happy with that suggestion. Now, as you all know, Richard always tried to go along with the wishes of others where possible. And that's a great characteristic. But like all strengths, it can become a weakness if exploited by others. And as the lab ch chat went on over lunch, it became clear that Richard had met an American scientist at a conference who was very keen to write a joint paper with him. The only slight problem was the American had no usable research results of his own. Despite this, he continued to press Richard, and by the time of the lunch, as Richard made clear, he would pretty much agreed to go along with this. Of course, as a new PhD student, I'd just done my little module on publishing ethics, and even I knew this was not a great idea. But I decided that in front of his team, I just needed to keep my trap shut. Suddenly, a member of his lab, and those of you who were there may remember who it was, could clearly contain her frustration no longer, and pointed out that this was ridiculous, and that his new American friend should be told to produce some publishable results himself, or take a running jump. Now, I tell this story because it's all too easy for a boss to be deluded by his own propaganda that he's omnipotent. The reality is we've all got our weaknesses and we need our teams to protect our backs in those areas. The problem, however, is that most bosses either deter their people from offering their views or, if they do offer their views, effectively ignore them. And the astonishing thing about Richard is that his team certainly didn't feel in the least deterred from telling him when he was going off piste. And even more important, he showed his willingness to listen and to act on their advice, as indeed he did on this occasion. Indeed, it was pretty clear to me that Richard regarded his team as extended family, and they felt the same way about him. And I think that's fully reflected in the attendance here today. Well, I'm afraid my allotted time is up, but what I would say in conclusion is that if fraternal astonishment is a good biomarker of greatness, then Richard passed the test. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much. Um, so next on the running elder is uh, David Hunter who was um, with Richard back in his early days in, in Magdalen College. Um, and he's going to reflect, I think, on, on that. So you're going to do the same for David? Oh, yeah, I shall undo you. Good point. The last time I saw one of yeah. those was around a cow's neck, figuring <laughs> an automatic feeding device. Uh, even lower tech, I'm afraid. 
Richard and I met at Maudlin in the autumn of 68 when we were both newly arrived undergraduates, and I'm pleased to say there are some other survivors of that cohort still here today, and possibly one or two, if they crack the technology, may be watching from afar. Now, in that period, Maudlin chose to house a lot of its freshmen in an annex slightly apart from the main building, which meant we had to walk across Maudlin Bridge first thing in the morning, rush hour, to get breakfast. Or at least those of us who took breakfast did. Medics and scientists who kept sensible hours tended to take breakfast. Airy, fairy, arty, farty types tended to start their day a little later, so not many did. And the lawyers waited until the coffee shops opened at 11 for theirs down the road. But quite a few of us in the building got to know each other in that first winter as we headed off to start the day with unhealthy amounts of cured pig meat, industrial toast, and strong coffee. Uh, and it's not much remembered now, but our undergraduate years coincided with uh, a great, never-repeated national experiment. Permanent summertime. After much debate and in the face of a lot of opposition from Scotland, the clocks went forward in the spring of 1968, but were not put back again until the autumn of 1971. And as a result, for three winters, dawn could be quite late, and we had breakfast quite often before first light. So in a very literal sense, like many others, we spent much of our undergraduate time in the dark. But it was on one such morning in the depths of the 68-69 winter that I, I lay claim to having been present at Richard's first professional consultation. On the way to breakfast, he and I came across a man on Maudlin Bridge who was having some kind of episode. I don't know what. He couldn't breathe, couldn't speak, couldn't tell us anything. So at this point, and with all the authority born, ooh, eight weeks of medical training, <laughs> Richard approached this complete stranger, told him that he was a medical student. I don't think he actually claimed to be a doctor, let's be fair, uh, and took charge of the situation, which he did. Now, I don't know how he did it, but somehow we got uh, an ambulance to the bridge pretty quickly and the bloke was removed to hospital safely, and I believe he survived. I thought, at the time, you know, Richard died the heading in the right profession here to be a medic, or possibly he was just a damn good impersonator of doctors, having seen so many pass through the family home when he was young. Now, I don't know what this patient thought, of course, but he might have been forgiven a moment or two of doubt as to his good fortune. Richard was tall, strongly built, athletic teenager, softly spoken, in a rather middle-class sort of way, and topped off or with a very casual appearance, uh, a very long hair, a head of very long blonde hair. This sort of package would not have said to a middle-aged stranger in the street in 1968, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> he might have instead feared that this was some kind of revolutionary Marxist or denizen of the local hippie commune, uh, but perhaps he was too far to care, too, too far gone to care, but at least he got the best of care in those circumstances. Actually, hair was a surprisingly contentious issue back in 1968. That would astonish the young, I know. Many people of the older generation just did not know how to read young men with long hair. They were either political radicals or dope-sniffing beatniks, moral degenerates, or worst of all, the people who always had a sick note to avoid games at school, maybe or thought. Richard's hair was long, very distinctive, much admired by contemporaries. Contemporaries of both sexes, we only knew two in those days, but they all admired it very much. <laughs> uh, Richard did tell me that before starting at university, he and his father had paid a visit to Cheltenham Races for the Gold Cup meeting. Now, I believe, I didn't know this until quite late on, I believe that old Dr. Wise and young Dr. Wise were not averse to a modest gamble on the horses, especially if it came in the form of a dead search tip from a patient. And on this occasion, Richard put a pound or so on a horse recommended by his father. It came nowhere. Feeling morally responsible for losing his student son a small sum of money, Dr. Tom offered to recompense him. Oh no, said Richard, it's a day out, no big deal, etc. You know, very learning experience, nothing to worry about, blah, blah. <coughs> Richard's father pressed to make good the son's losses eventually trying to tuck a pound note into the breast pocket of his jacket. At which point, a fellow race-goer, complete stranger, stepped between the two Wises, barking at old Dr. Wise something like, You filthy brute! 
why can't men of your sort leave young chaps alone? <laughs> Since the wise gene pool tends to produce strapping healthy males, this seems to be a potentially foolhardy <laughs> intrusion to make. Um, this was 68. Appearances could be quite deceptive in lots of ways. I think it wouldn't be unfair to say that Richard, 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 Richard was pretty much indifferent to appearance. He could scrub up pretty impressively for the occasional black tie event, but his general appearance was on what you might call the um, smart casual line, so long as you underemphasize the smart bit. One winter he acquired what was then called an Afghan coat, <laughs> for older readers, a sort of sheepskin rug come gilet with embroidery on the non-woolly side, worn inside out. This uh, on Richard with his size, the hair, the quizzical expression, his rather large feet and a short, quick stride, gave Richard a very distinctive appearance. I, I'd think of a, an affable, if rather baffled, yeti shuffling its way around college. And, and he was a, a big man. Uh, at, at some point, he got dubbed by one of my contemporaries, Lurch, after the lugubrious giant butler in an American TV series called The Adams Family. Uh, and if you find uh, Lurch the butler online via Google, you'll see there is a, you know, a, a, a colourable resemblance between Richard and this giant figure. In our third year, we lived in a house in North Oxford, where the other four residents learned to admire Richard's ability to function in the midst of considerable disorder. I'm not sure if he was simply indifferent to or possibly biochemically allergic to the very idea of tidiness. His room, uh, well, to put it mildly, uh, was much more Tracy Emin than John Lewis. It was at the front of the house on the ground floor, and I've got a vague memory that one of us came back late one night, having forgotten to take a key. Now, security was another of Richard's weaker points, shall we say. So whoever it was, with no key, quietly effected entrance to the house through Richard's open window only to let out a terrified scream on seeing what more, looked more than a little like a half-butchered gorilla hanging on the bedroom door. This was the first wetsuit that we came to associate with Richard. Richard had, however, beside all these characteristics, a, a very creative side. He liked mooching around art galleries, usually looking at abstract paintings or sculptures. And the, abs uh, the artistic side, I think, came out rather more in later years with his photographic interests. We regularly received a handmade Christmas card from Richard, usually an atmospheric black and white composition presented on some high quality card with a lengthy, amusing and probably libelous note on the inside, always written in ink, never in ballpoint. Uh, but welcome as these cards always were, they were of a piece with other aspects of Richard's social organization. To put it bluntly, Richard's Christmas cards could arrive at almost any time between Boxing Day and Good Friday. <laughs> he had always what one might call a rather plastic sense of time and a rather limited acquaintance with conventional, even convenient, administration. As an undergraduate, his idea of secure storage and filing for personal documents was very straightforward. They were in a square biscuit tin that lived under his bed. And he built on this a very simple and effective way of prioritizing administrative, administrative demands on his time. The latest papers would go on top of the heap in the tin, and he simply ignored all of them until the relevant authorities eventually compelled him to respond in some minimal way. But let me end with a couple slightly more serious points, perhaps. Richard read and thought rather more widely than might have been suspected at first blush. Intellectually, he was quite clear strongly clear for someone of his age on some particulars. Resolutely Darwinian, happy to see humans as an interesting product of Godfrey evolution. And he was fascinated by what this meant for moral issues. What did right and wrong mean if we we're just a bundle of uh, barely controlled electrical impulses? And he applied this kind of logic to all sorts of issues in social areas of medicine for answer. For example, where the, the wise lectures on human fertility, as we came to call them, became widely celebrated among his undergraduate contemporaries. And he had a high sense of his own medical vocation. He was then, as ever after, no friend of private medicine. And if this sounds a bit severe, I don't mean it to be really. He was always good company, generous and non-judgmental. 
He toured bits of Europe with some friends in the summer of 1970, part of a group which bought a punt for itself one summer on the grounds that that was more economical than hiring one from time to time. Now, while his culinary and navigational skills, certainly at that time of his life, left something to be desired, all those friendships remained intact. And I believe later on he became quite a nifty baker. Finally, I think I would observe at the end of our undergraduate time, it was clear he knew where he wanted to go, and he was thoroughly absorbed by his studies in that direction. He said to me once that he was increasingly interested in the brain. He'd read someone's opinion that then current knowledge and understanding of the brain was a bit like what the early 19th century adventurers knew about Africa. The coastline was pretty well mapped, but there was a lot in the interior that had yet to be properly explored. And that was the journey he wanted. It's for others to comment on his career achievements. But for me and for others, he was always the best and most stimulating of company. Gentle, quiet, thoughtful, and amused. Always the man I bumped into in 1968. Thanks, David. That was uh, great. Um, so next up, we're going to shift to the Cyclotron unit. Terry Jones um, is going to come and tell us. My, Terry was at the, the heart, really, of the MRC Cyclotron unit. My memory is of having lunch with Richard and Terry, and Terry banging the table in such enthusiasm about whatever he was doing. So uh, <laughs> look forward to hearing it. You manage. <laughs> Oh, good evening. I'm going to talk about Richard's early research with positron emission tomography PET at the MRC Cyclotron Unit at Hammersmith Hospital. And before we had a PET scanner, we had developed a method to image the regional oxygen consumption and blood flow in the brain. And we explored the value of that in a various range of brain disorders using a gamma camera, which is a planar view of the brain, very qualitative. But well, we got enough information from these, those patients we looked at early days that if we had a more accurate way of looking at the brain with tomography and, and quantification, which PET scanning allowed, we could do a lot more interesting research. So we applied to the MRC, said, look, we've got all these proof of concepts that we need this new kit, and combined with proposals for oncology and cardiology and the lung, the MRC gave us a PET scanner from 1979, the first PET scan in the UK. Keith Peters was very supportive of this, and he sent, he convinced Richard Fokoviak to come and work with us to launch the uh, uh, program. And um, Richard came, and he was very uh, dynamic. He got the methodology going, so we could actually measure quantitatively blood flow and oxygen consumption in absolute units. And it required looking at enormous subjects and taking arterial blood. But that was very successful. He went on to do his own work in dementia and also chronic stroke with Gianluigi Lenzi, who had worked earlier with us using the gamma camera on chronic stroke. Now, also, Richard very well had forged the links or consolidated the links with Queen Square, and that was very important that, that the relationship between Queen Square and Hammersmith from a neurological point of view, particularly with Professor John Marshall, who was very supportive of this work. So really, uh, we were then thinking, what really what we want to look at is the acute stroke, because there was animal work which showed that in the acute animal model, there was residual um, active tissue in what they call a penumbra at that point, still viable some hours after the stroke. And the question is, can we see this in patients, in the stroke patients? So uh, John Marshall wrote a proposal from the, um, the heart, uh, lung, and um, stroke Association for a grant, and that was money for a new research registrar, Richard Rice. So Richard came along, and I was a bit puzzled in the first few days. He wasn't quite sure why he was there. It took him a while to twig it, really, and then suddenly, I think, by talking to people like Professor Marshall and whatever, said, OK, we've got to go for it now. We've got the real challenge. How are you going to image early stroke patients? So both Richards, fair play to them, both out into the Department of Medicine, Charing Cross, Central Middlesex, 
getting the word out there to the metabolism, the, the, met, the medicine people saying, we're looking for early strokes. Because that's the thing. And it worked very well. And they got him uh, from, uh, from the three hospitals systematically. And in fact, the earliest stroke we ever got was by a doctor called Mark Woodbutt, who I think is quite senior now. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd just gone on a ward, and I think he'd been badgered by the both Richards saying, we must get patients. And he just, one of his patients had just stroked out, and within an hour and a half or two hours, he was on the, on the scanning bed. So that was really something. Now, what did they find? Richard found that um, actually within sort of 24 hours after the ictus, there was within the infarct, there was still residual oxygen metabolism, despite the fact there was very much reduced flow. And that means it was, a, it was just hanging on by extracting more oxygen out of the blood, but it was certainly there. But when he scanned the same patients four or five days later, that had gone. So it appeared as if there was a window here of opportunity, of viable tissue still, but if you could revascularize it, you may, in fact, improve the, the outcome. Now, this observation was actually reinforced by our friendly rivals in Paris, called Jean-Claude Baron, who had also done similar observations, and he called it misery perfusion. This is a miserable condition. It's hanging on there by extracting more oxygen. So everything was endorsed as findings. So this is a very exciting finding, and I have to read from his thesis what he thought the implication of this finding was. And he said, well, we want to revascularize, but you know, blood pressure changes don't really work. Surgical revascularization is dangerous. You get here, um, um, bleeding. But he said, that recently there's been, I'm reading from his thesis now, there has been a recent report of the successful use of local fibrolytic therapy after selective cannulation of the occluded artery. This is Zuma from Aachen, 1983. It's a year before he submitted his thesis. But the big paragraph in his, in his thesis is this. Therefore, the means to achieve reflow in human ischemic lesions, at least in a proportion of cases, with objective assessment of functional effects, may be possible in suitably equipped centers in the near future. He was heralding the introduction of specialized stroke units. And really, over the, over the last three decades, armed with the knowledge that there is a window of opportunity to salvage, and we have then the tools of revascularization with streptokinase, whatever it was, there's been, I think the stroke units have been very successful. And these are two components which have driven that, that, that whole uh, uh, endeavor. He went on to also to look at glucose metabolism in the infarct versus oxygen metabolism, and we found that it was high, the infarct was consuming a lot of glucose and not so much oxygen. And we scratched our heads on this, and Richard dived into the, the pathology literature and found, in fact, that infarcts are full of infl in, inflammatory cells, in, you know, macrophages, and, and, and really inf inf inflaming the situation. And it was known that they like to eat, consume glucose glycolytically without oxygen, and it was a hallmark of inflammation. Of course, and that since then, again, there's a lot of interest in being able to dampen down the inflammation in the brain uh, with anti-inflammatory procedures. Uh, I think the work's still ongoing. It's, uh, it's interesting. I don't think it's really hit the mark as yet, but it's an ongoing object to soften down the body's ref uh, inflammatory response to, uh, to the brain. The other finding is and with Chris Rhodes, they looked at the, the, the glucose metabolism versus oxygen metabolism in gliomas. And they found, again, the glioma was consuming glucose, but not oxygen. It was preferring to use glucose glycolytically, and it was, it was really reinforcing what had been observed before the war by Warburg, or the Warburg effect in tumors. But it's the first time it's been shown in a human tumor. Now, the significance of this is that the hallmark is tumors like the gobble glucose. And now, of all the PET scanners in the world, 99% of them are used to image glucose. They look at tumors, stage tumors, look at their response to treatment, etc. But this was the first demonstration in the human being of this glycolytic uh, preference. So his thesis produced uh, three, I think, quite impacting uh, observations. He acknowledged many people in his, in his thesis, particularly the members of the MRC Cyclotron unit, the, the scientific and the technical support. Adrian Mertzmer was here from Amsterdam. He, he thanked for his um, uh, cheery skepticism. 
Chrissy is thanked for his acerbic memoranda. Uh, Alex for his technical support, and John Clark and the chemist for all their being able to supply traces at odd hours, at short, because the patient's coming wasn't on the schedule, but now he's coming. Can you make some isotope for us? And that was the acknowledge you guys. Richard Fokoviak left to uh, do his, his training, and Richard Wise then was a head boy, as it were, looking after the new recruits and bringing on people like uh, Jeremy Gibbs, who did some wonderful work looking at the carotid artery disease and looking at the effects of endarterectomy and, and bypass. And also, he convinced David Brooks to join the, join the team. Now, whether David thinks that was a good thing now, or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, we had good, good, talented people came on and were very, very, very productive. Richard left. Uh, to continue his clinical training at Queen Square and at King's with David Marsden. And then in, in 1988, uh, we had a new camera, which gave him more topography of the brain, and that heralded the introduction of brain activation. And, uh, and, and Richard, with his interest in stroke and, and the manifestations of stroke, we became involved in using this new tool to understand the stroke brain by activation. And I'm going to hand over to Carl now, who's going to tell you the rest of the story. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this review of, of Richard's legacies and contributions. My particular pleasure to learn about him. So I, I didn't know half of that stuff academically. Um, that, was, that was very interesting. So I arrived in 1988 at exactly the point uh, that Terry uh, stopped telling the story. Um, and I am going to pursue, in part, just celebrating some of Richard's academic and intellectual legacies. Uh, possibly legacies which you may not be aware of, but I think are absolutely fundamental and quite foundational. But I also close on some personal legacies uh, from my point of view. To put that in context, I'm going to have to do a bit of science first. Um, so, Alex, as a seasoned, experienced imaging neuroscientist, well versed in the taxonomy <laughs> of experimental design, if you. Nope. <laughs> if, if you, I, I haven't cued him about this, I hope he gets it right. Other, but the, next, <laughs> the next slide has the answers if he doesn't. If you can remember back to your SPM short courses, and I'm asking you about... Oh, <laughs> okay. if, uh, I asked you, or you, I asked you to tell your students, what are the three basic sorts of experimental design that you could deploy in a brain activation experiment? <laughs> it's terribly clever, but not quite what I was groping, not quite what I was groping for. Ah, oh, you haven't been to the SPM short course. Anybody? Ask it. Oh, very good. Yes. What? Well, uh, dumb down a bit. Richard hated those. Yeah, oh, really? Very good. One more. Excellent. Thank you very much. And just to prove that he was absolutely right, this is a slide, I think, taken from a 2004 SBM short course by Tom Nichols, categorizing or uh, putting this sort of fundamental sort of uh, experimental design that you could bring to the table when doing any imaging experiment, whether it be with PET or um, fMRI. In terms of categorical, categorical designs, also known as subtraction designs, parametric designs, and factorial designs. And literally, if you go to standard texts uh, on this subject and try to get your head around how you're going to use this kit, uh, this is exactly the backbone that you would see. So very briefly, the, the notion of subtraction um, entails just comparing activity in the brain in one brain state or under one condition with the activity in the brain in another condition. And if you can identify the key components that distinguish those two brain states, you can then associate that particular cognitive component or sensory motor component or attentional component with the difference in activity. So you just subtract 
activity in brain state one from brain state two. And the difference, the subtraction, starts to give you a picture, a window on the functional anatomy and the cartography uh, and the functional specialization. The fundamental sort of tenet um, uh, um, of experimental design. That in and of itself um, does not, though, capture some of the more subtle differences in terms of a parametric or a continuous response. So instead of just comparing brain state A with brain state B, you might want to drive the system in some parametric way, um, increasing the luminance of a visual contrast, or indeed at the between subject level, severity of some particular um, um, incompetence due to brain insult. And that calls for parametric designs where you're looking for correlations between what you're manipulating and the brain's response in and only in some functionally specialized segregated brain area. And that rests upon parametric designs encoded here by the parametric increase in the A. And then finally, the, what the fact, the, um, the denouement of designs, which always is a little bit challenging, it's basically differences in differences. So it's moving to a slightly higher order. And these rest upon factorial designs. And the key trick here is to manipulate two things independently at the same time. And the idea is that you are, if you like, moving to the next level with the subtraction designs and asking whether it matters, the activation going from brain state one to brain state two, whether you are in context A or context B. And the degree to which it changes, there's a difference in the differences, tells you about the interaction, the context sensitivity of these, uh, of these responses. So why am I going on about this? Well, what you may not know is that Richard and his group were the key architects of this tripart on ontology. So in every one of these three cardinal examples of the sorts of experimental designs that everybody uses throughout the world today, Richard was the author of the, of the first papers that actually employed these in, in a meaningful way. Um, and I'm going to just sort of take you through those three seminal papers as foundational papers by referring to these foundational years of brain activation studies, brain mapping studies that used responses of the brain in a dynamic way to try and map out functionally specialized areas of integration. And it was a glorious time. So I've just highlighted the period I'm focusing on here from 1992 uh, to uh, 1998. So at this point, uh, we've heard about the story this far, and at this point, the first brain activation studies were emerging in the literature, usually the prestige literature. Um, fMRI, for those of you who use it, had not been invented at that stage. That came into the game uh, at about here. And then these, uh, the application of these new technologies to understanding brain mapping and function anatomy really started to take off um, at around here. And this was the time when it was like doing science on steroids from my point of view. Uh, it was, you know, people were moving around. I'd just come back from America, having spent a year uh, since 1988. Um, everybody was on the move, both intellectually, both in terms of the technology, and crucially, in terms of writing down the foundations that are still in play today in terms of determining how we actually approach the academic and the, uh, the systems neuroscience applications of neuroimaging. So let's just rehearse again those three key papers. So I've chosen um, this particular paper. I could have actually chosen a number of other papers in terms of, um, sort of uh, meaningful applications of the subtractive paradigm or the categorical paradigm. Um, I've chosen it for a couple of reasons. First of all, the first author is Cornelis, and where is he? He's, uh, there you go. So now he's the czar uh, of uh, imaging in, um, in, in Freiburg, I and mean, he said Frankfurt, uh, Freiburg, um, uh, and himself, uh, you know, one of the, the, the sort of living giants of uh, new academic neurology and neuroimaging um, Europe. Um, and the, the reason I've chosen this paper is it was uh, probably the first, I can't testify exactly that, but certainly the first I am aware of, of applying that subtractive design, categorical design, to uh, a, a question that matters, namely, you know, how are your brain responses 
confounded by neuropathology, pathophysiology, and this piece of stroke. So just to highlight, uh, we have now developed a new positron emission tomographic technique to me measure the changes in regional cerebral blood flow elicited during a motor task in individual patients relative to the cerebral activation found in normal subjects. So this was the very, very first application of the subtractive design to be deployed in the context of translational clinical neuroscience. Uh, an incredible piece of work, uh, and I'll comment on why uh, at the end. Second thing, parametric studies. Um, so here, um, Richard worked with Christian Buchel, who himself now is, was a close colleague of Cornelius and now is, is the uh, head of imaging at Hamburg. And the key idea here was, this, was to enable us to map or the user to map the neurometric correlates or functions that you could induce experimentally. Um, so again, we present, we actually introduced, a non-interactive method which fits nonlinear functions of stimulus or task parameters to regional cerebral uh, blood flow responses. A clever device um, because they use what is called the general linear model to ask quite deep questions about nonlinear brain stimulus or brain task relationships using, uh, as it goes on to say, a polynomial expansion. Again, notice this was the first paper of the, the uh, second of these, this trilogy of experimental designs. And then we come to the factorial designs. And Richard's group, and in particular the first author, Kathy Price here, would I think be acknowledged as introducing factorial designs to cognitive neuroscience in the context this, um, I repeat, really requires a little bit of sort of mental athletics. So you, you, what you're thinking about now is differences in differences and these sort of, if you like, the multiplication or the second order response profiles of the brain. <coughs> uh, summarized here, so this study demonstrates, I'm going to <coughs> illustrate this difference of difference um, um, concept. This study demonstrates that Broca's area is involved in both auditory word perception and repetition, but activation is dependent upon task, namely it is greater during repetition than hearing, and stimulus presentation, namely greater when hearing words at a low rate. So really drilling down on the context sensitivity of brain responses to, uh, to start to understand the responses of one brain region in the context of activity elsewhere, distributed processing. A, a, a fundamentally important study, paper. Um, also, interestingly, just for the, uh, the um, aficionados in the audience, one of the first papers that dared to mix differences in task and stimuli. Very, very daring to do that. It's all <coughs> sorts of interesting interactions uh, that arise from that. So that's my review of um, some of Richard's contributions that I think have possibly been understated. I repeat, he and his group were the key people doing cognitive neuroscience in those early um, uh, foundational years of brain mapping. So nowadays, when your students, or indeed possibly when many members of the audience just glibly go, go in and design their treat by two factorial design or cross a categorical factor with some neurometric function as in computation, by war prediction. It is easy to forget that these concepts, this knowing you can do that sort of thing, were just not there at the beginning. Somebody had to sit down and worry about this for several years, develop these concepts, develop the analytic tools, and then validate them. And those people were Richard and his group, and it was done here. It was done here during that period uh, from 1990, 1988 through to um, 1990. So an amazing legacy, foundational in that particular area. I just want to close, though, by noting, of course, there are lots of other legacies that we could talk about. And we just have to acknowledge the, um, you know, the legacies that Richard must have left as a family man and uh, just refer to the, I thought, beautifully articulated stories that we heard at Richard's funeral, very moving, I thought. I've gone through what I consider the... Uh, uh, canonical example of his intellectual academic legacies. Uh, I also want to acknowledge personal legacies in a slightly almost trivial way. 
sort of the legacies that you may not notice on a day-to-day -day basis until he, he, he has gone. So these are two photographs taken last week of what I see when I come into my office. That's what I see as I would sit down and look at the computer. And if I turn around, that's my smoking balcony here, uh, mm -hmm. framed uh, nicely with its, with its um, aluminium doors, double doors. The key thing is, though, what I actually see are both legacies from Richard. So this is a photograph, and I should say that I inherited my office from Richard. Uh, and part of that inheritance was that he gifted me this. This is one of my treasures. These are all my treasures here that students leave me. But this is the, the key treasure there. That's a photograph uh, from Richard that he actually explicitly gave me. I've got that there still. I see it every day. Um, there's another pair of presents here, which you can't really see. My apologies. I've, I'm taking pictures with them. Uh, these are actually dried flower arrangements um, that were actually Richard's treasures. And he wasn't quite so explicit as, as to whether he was giving them to me or whether I was the custodian. So after two years, they were still there. Uh, I bought these nice pl uh, pot stands to, to, to celebrate them. So in closing, I'm just trying to make the point um, that there are all sorts of legacies that we could talk about. And perhaps the ones that go missed are those legacies in the lived world that we experience every day. So I just want to thank you for your attention and to thank Richard for the legacies. Thank you. Thanks, Carl and Terry. I think that really captured some of the excitement of the early days here. I know Richard was incredibly proud of, uh, of what happened and what he contributed and the people he worked with, many of whom are in the audience. Um, so next, uh, we've got Harry. And Harry has worked with Richard for many years, decades, Forever. really. Um, and uh, we'll hand over to you, Harry. Thank you. I'm just going to have some of this. Dave, just say the bow tie is a really good idea today. <laughs> <laughs> do you have slides? Or? I do have some slides. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. I think that's the first one of your talks that I've uh, actually understood. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's only taken 20 something years, but <laughs> finally getting there. Uh, this is the Hammersmith Hospital you'll recognize, um, and that's where I first met Richard. But I'd actually, I'd heard about him before, because uh, a, a very good uh, friend of mine who I'd worked with a couple of years before, she'd been a medical registrar at the Central Middlesex Hospital, which should be, I hope this is a picture of the old Central Middlesex Hospital. Can anyone confirm that? Because otherwise it's just some random Victorian <laughs> workhouse that I've downloaded off the, uh, off the internet. I think this is the building before they demolished it to build there for their PFI thing. Anyway, um, at, this friend of mine worked as a medical registrar at Central Middlesex Hospital. She said to me, she said, there's this, there's this neurologist I've been sitting in on some of these clinics. It's fantastic. And actually, this is very, uh, one of the first examples I'd come across of nominative determinism. She said, do you know what? He's really, really clever. And guess what? His name is Wise. <laughs> <laughs> so that was um, the first time I'd come across Richard. And then I met him uh, at uh, Hammersmith Hospital. And he was indeed Wise. And um, that's just um, some blobs. That's a pet study. Bono or fMRI? Don't know. One or the other. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about science. Um, I want to say a little bit about Richard as a, as a, as a doctor, because um, although we work, were at the same time at the, at, uh, in, in the pet unit at Hammersmith Hospital, I was interested in tasks which involved doing this, uh, and Richard wasn't, so our paths didn't cross that much. We did actually, I think about the only thing we ever wrote together was some correspondence in The Lancet, um, where we were criticizing somebody else's research, which I think is fair enough. But um, uh, we did work together clinically with him as, a, as the consultant there and then me as the registrar when he was here, here and at Charing Cross um, and, and, and then later on still. And the thing that struck me was that you know, as, as he progressed in his academic career, he still remained a consummate physician. And um, he was one of those, this rare breed who could really combine that sort of the, the academic world with being, with being an excellent clinician 
um, at ease with his patients, with his colleagues, just a fantastic opinion. I think all the um, and registrars and others here who work with him would, would re recognize that, that he was always a really good clinical opinion. He was always available um, and to discuss cases and um, a reassuring presence to have. Um, that's Picasso, uh, Picasso, by the way, painted this in his teens. Um, not his usual um, style. This is, in fact, oh, this is this bow tie actually, but, but um, it, uh, I, I think we have to say something about bow ties and, and, and Richard. And I think the key thing to say is that Richard always knew when it was exactly the right moment to wear a bow tie. Um, he knew when he needed to. You, you could tell if you, if you were phoning him about a difficult clinical problem or a patient with a, a family were being a bit tricky, something like that, Richard would know that he said, he's, um, he said okay, you need me to come to me to wear the bow tie. Okay, uh, and he would, he would come along and he would then be that sort of reassuring senior presence. Uh, and here are a couple of examples. I think that, that picture you've obviously uh, seen already in Carl's talk, that just, uh, it's fantastic sideburns here actually at this stage. But uh, a couple of nice bow ties. I know Dave, the, the tie you're wearing is one that Richard, Richard gave you as well, yeah. which is uh, really nice. Um, he also introduced me to the concept, he talked about Hammersmith professors as, as uh, silverbacks. Um, and I, it seemed, I think it's now acquired some rather interesting sort of urban slang connotations, which, um, which you can look up. Um, and, uh, but uh, that brings me on. This is David Marsden, uh, who's already just been mentioned. Richard was uh, worked with him at King's. Richard was his last senior registrar, I think, there before Marsden moved to uh, Queen Square um, to take the, uh, the chair in neurology there. And, and he was a, a, a great example of a clinician um, scientist. Uh, and I think Richard did learn a lot from him. And um, the other thing to say about Richard, Richard was fantastic. One thing I always remember, actually, is a fantastic gossip. I think, I think it's fair to say, love, love gossip, absolutely. I mean, you could spend hours just sort of talking to him about all sorts of stuff. And, and so he had um, great anecdotes about Marsden, amongst others, none of which um, I can repeat uh, now. But uh, anyway, I thought he deserved a mention. Uh, Richard, very keen cyclist, of course. Um, this, is a, this is a Cannondale bike. I had to choose a Cannondale because he was very keen on Cannondales. Um, and I, it's one of the, a couple of things here I just wanted to mention that I'm very grateful to Richard for. One was, he was the person who persuaded me that in order to cycle in London, you didn't have to be, how to have a death wish or a suicidal tendencies. Um, and I started cycling um, because of Richard, actually. And uh, uh, we used to meet occasionally along on the Uxbridge Road on our way into, way into work. With, uh, and, uh, and I'll always remember that. And um, he also introduced to me, he told me, Richard, is, as we've already heard, is erudite, he was clever, he was interested in the visual arts and the written word as well. Um, and he introduced me to this series of novels, The Dance of the Music of Time, by Anthony Pohl, which I never would have read otherwise, and um, which is fantastic. If anyone has read it, or if anyone hasn't read it, you've got a huge treat in store if you do. Um, one of the great characters in English literature called Wigmapool in there, who's a sort of a, a, a bureaucratic sort of buffoon who sort of gets promoted and promoted and promoted. Um, so if you haven't read it, do read it. Um, and um, now Richard wasn't, wasn't perfect. Um, I think it's fair to say the two sort of lacunes in, in, um, that he had. One was... Um, with regards to music, although he was interested in the visual arts and everything else, music was kind of a bit of a blank canvas for him. I think that's fair to say, is that right? Yeah. Um, and the second one is his insistence on making martinis with vodka, <laughs> which is clearly right. If, if he's listening now, that is wrong. <laughs> okay. that, that's how you make a martini. Okay, so. And then one last thing, I was um, struck Recently, it came to, it, I, I thought about this when I was obviously recently in the news, tragically, the, the Glasgow, this is the Glasgow School of Art, this is the library of the Glasgow School of Art by Charles Rennie Mackintosh, and um, 
Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, recently, for the second time in a few years, um, it's devastated by fire, which is an absolute tragedy. Um, and it reminded me of a, a story which it actually concerns Dave and, um, uh, as well. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you. So a few years ago, uh, we were all at there was an Association of British Neurologists meeting in, in Glasgow. Um, and Richard was there. We had a really nice few days up in Glasgow. Very nice evening. At, there's, a, there's a restaurant called the Ubiquitous Chip. Very, very nice with murals by Alistair Gray, sort of a Glaswegian polymath. Um, and I think the evening started out that we found a vodka, well, it was actually a lesbian vodka bar uh, <laughs> opposite. So we had cocktails there first and then onto the restaurant. Anyway, at the end of the meeting, um, Richard and I had hatched up a plan. We were flying back to London that we would try and put in a visit to the Glasgow School of Art just to have a look at this fantastic building. So we, we'd got it all lined up. We got this taxi at the end of the meeting, um, and we had to stay to the end because he made an arrangement with Dave that, that he would, you had to leave early, and he was going to collect your poster. OK, here's the poster. <laughs> it's you. Um, and so we had to wait until the end, take this poster down. Then we were going to get a cab. Then we were going to get to the Glasgow School of Art. And then we were going to go on to the airport. So we, we met up. He collected your post. He had the tube here, took it up. We had to get a taxi. Trying to get this thing into a taxi was a, was a nightmare. So we piled in the taxi, got to the Glasgow School of Art, managed to blag our way in, have a look around, had a look at all of this while it was still there, got to the airport. Of course, we just had hand luggage. This wouldn't go in the hand luggage. It had to go in the whole, whole thing. Richard was getting a bit... Cross. Why did I say? Why did I say I'd do this? Why did I say I'd take this bloody thing back? And, and then and got back to London. Then we had to wait for the uh, the baggage cartel, pick up your poster, wait ages. Then got back, took it back to the Hammersmith. So that's all fine. And then two weeks later, Dave, you got a phone call from the ABN saying, um, "Your poster, the one you left in Glasgow, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would you like us to do with it?" So it actually missed the important step of um, taking the poster <laughs> off the wall and putting it in the tube. Anyway, so I just want to say Richard was, was many things, but he was, he, was, he, he, was, he was a wonderful friend, a loyal friend, and, and, and a great colleague, and we'll all miss him um, hugely. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. My recollection of that, of that trip to Glasgow is, uh, I don't know if you remember going up, actually. You had your long trench coat on, and yes. we went through, through uh, um, security checks. And you were pulled, and you had a very large knife in the trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> you were arrested, weren't you, I think, briefly? I was the idea. Hand over to Alex. Alex. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I've just got a couple of slides to show, and, and no surprise MCQs for Carl. Um, this, this is a picture of me. Uh, I've been told I've got a healthy level of narcissism, but that's not why I'm <laughs> showing it. Um, it's because it's a, a picture, um, as you've <clears throat> heard, Richard, a very, very a an excellent photographer, and it's a picture that Richard took of me. And this was relatively soon after I started. Um, so I met Richard in, in 96, but this was when I was working with him at the Hammersmith. And we, uh, this, was, this must have been 98, and the Eurostar had relatively recently opened up. And uh, we went on a, a, a sort of um, uh, a trip from the unit, which about half the people went. There's about 40 of us. And Terry Jones um, put some money in, and Paul Grasby, who's in the audience, came along. Um, I don't think David could make it that day. Anyway, for those of you who've seen the sort of um, videos that Fatima put together, there's a, a long story there that uh, started with. We, we got a special deal, but we had to be on the train before 7 a.m. It was really difficult to get everybody down for that, and um, some of us started drinking then. And anyway, the whole thing, <laughs> the whole thing went very well. The point was really to make the point actually that, that Harry's already made that Richard had a real eye um, for the visual world, um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen lots of his excellent uh, photographs. And he just got better and better. And I, like Carl, I've got some on my wall. Um, but yeah, he was very visual and not not very auditory, um, as um, Harry's pointed out. And actually, that linked to a, to a, to a sort of study that was done. Um, so, I, I mean, I just think he, he was perhaps a bit differently wired from the rest of us. And um, as we've heard, he was always um, 
volunteering. So he, he had loads of PET scans. He went into one of my PET scans. Uh, but when the Hammersmith finally accepted that there may be something in MRI as, as well as in PET, um, he got involved in, in some of the early work that uh, Sonia Brownsett was doing, who's a couple of um, speech and language therapists who did PhDs with him, um, on connectivity. And he was like, hand straight up, went in the scanner. And they were quite long, these, these tractography um, scans. Certainly at the beginning, they've come down in time now. So he sat in the scanner, got his brain scanned for tractography. And with tractography, you sort of look at the connectivity between one region and another. Uh, and Sonia had wanted to look at the frontal lobes, so she put a couple of regions of interest on the frontal lobes. And it turned out that Richard's frontal lobes were not connected to anything except, them, <laughs> except themselves. <laughs> Which was sort of at the time thought to be a failure of the technique, but I'm actually, the more stories we hear, I wonder. So this is a nice picture of Richard that was, was taken um, in the last conference we were at, which was organized by a colleague of mine called Randy Starfelt, who some of you will know, um, who's particularly interested in reading. This is back in 2014. And reading is really what, what I got interested in um, when I first uh, met Richard. So as I said, uh, I first met him in 96. I was an SHO at Queen's Square. Um, and I was actually working on the rehab unit, which at that time was at Finchley. And I was working with Diane Playford, who had done her PhD with David Brooks, um, looking at movement disorders. And I said I was interested in the brain and interested in language. And Diane said, oh, you must go and speak to Richard down at Queen's Square. So I made an appointment and met him. Actually, I think it was a transition because he was in, I think he was sharing your office at that point, Carl. He hadn't quite left um, to come over here at that point. And I found him on the floor making a poster with a stick and things like that. And uh, I said I was interested in language. It wasn't quite the same interview that, that David had. There was no, no booze at that point. Um, but we had a little chat. He said, I'll oh, write a sort of grant proposal type thing and hand it in to me and I'll see what you think. Obviously, he was testing my ability to write and think a bit. And anyway, uh, it was all very informal, um, as we've heard. And um, he went on to put me on his welcome grant for a year or so before I could get my own funding via a fellowship. And this was all to do with reading because he'd been working up, um, he spent a day, a day of the week up at the Royal Free, um, which I used to go to. and. Uh, at that time, he spent a lot of time with Hilary Cruz, and she had got into this reading disorder, rather unusual reading disorder called hemianopic alexia or hemianopic dyslexia. So it's patients who have trouble reading because they're missing half of their vision. I won't, won't go into the details too much, but Richard was getting quite interested in this and wanted to do some PET imaging to look at the brain networks involved. Um, and I was rather reluctant, I have to say, because I was very, very interested in aphasia or language, language disorders in general, and this seemed a bit niche for me. But anyway, he persuaded me to, to get involved in it, and I've been involved ever since. In fact, the first paper we wrote together um, using a, a, um, a categorical design car, um, looking at single words and, and sentences, um, and looking at, at how this visual impairment um, causes changes in the parts of the brain that control the eye movements, uh, and how that can be remediated. Um, so that was the first paper we wrote together, which was in 2000. And really, ever since then, I've been involved in reading, and particularly in, in therapies uh, for reading. Um, and uh, the last paper we wrote, I was looking back, the last paper we wrote together, which was in 2013, um, was also on reading and reading disorders. And this time, there was a therapy involved, uh, and a therapy that um, we had developed through um, Zoe Woodhead, who's a... Um, psychologist, experimental psychologist who worked with Richard and then came and worked with me. So there was a nice sort of line of study going through all of that. And I think Richard was always very interested in the brain uh, and, and in um, the networks involved in, in language. Um, and I think somewhat reluctantly, I think he's a bit old fashioned, perhaps got some of his therapeutic nihilism perhaps from his colleagues. Um, but I was always keen to push towards therapy and, and these latter papers where we did a lot of practice-based therapy with these patients. We did show some um, functional improvements. Patients with this condition called pure alexia, which is what this, where this picture was taken. It was taken at a pure alexia conference. Um, so that sort of came full circle. So um, I've got a lot to thank him for. He got me interested in reading, which has become a huge thing for me and something that we've, again, we've just published a paper um, a couple of weeks ago where we've done a therapy app, something he was, again, a little bit skeptical about, um, but has proven to be effective, and we're going to roll, roll that out. I just really like this picture of Richard. I mean, it, there's another picture that you've seen more taken from the same comp. And um, it's obviously a bit blurred, this. But I think it's just got his, that sort of urge to communicate that he's got, which I think uh, he always was, was fascinated in. I think one of the reasons he was always interested in language is he certainly explained to me it's all about getting ideas from your mind into somebody else's mind. I think that's what he's trying to do. So um, 
pretty missing. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Um, so we're going to hand over to, to Matt Lamb and Ralph. Um, just get your slides up, Matt. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so while they're coming, I think I think I met Richard and Alex about the same time and was, must have had an innocent upbringing at that point. I'd never had a martini before. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say, Harry, that I was very, very proud of the fact that a few years later, I introduced Richard to a Vespa, um, which he'd never had before, looked rather quizzically at me. We're in, a, in the middle of Chicago. I had to explain to the barman how to make one, which seemed to go down quite well with Richard. And it's at least halfway back to a gin martini, so um, maybe a slight redemption for him. So obviously, um, Richard was an excellent wonderful father and a clinician and a researcher. I'm very proud of the fact that he and I collaborated over the years. I never worked in Richard's group, um, but he was always extremely welcoming. So I think I was a PhD student uh, working in York at the time when I first came and met Alex and Richard, and we had great fun and the first uh, Vulcan mod. And then later on we had a grant that actually supported Jenny Crinion and other and occasional other papers. That was wonderful and I'm very proud of that. Um, I knew that we were going to hear about the fact he was a wonderful clinician and researcher, so I thought I'd uh, give you some other couple of anecdotes. He was also an extremely fine travel companion, um, as well as obviously a photographer, and something that he and I actually shared a love of. So travel companion, I discovered this. I'd moved um, from York to Cambridge, and then Cambridge quickly via Bristol to Manchester in 2001. And for reasons I still don't understand, I received an invitation from Beijing to visit. And they were very enthusiastic about having a neuropsychologist to come. And then they said, oh, by the way, you don't happen to know a, a neuroimager, do you? We, we're getting into functional neuroimaging. And Rich and I have been working probably beyond the grant with Jenny, I thought, if there's somebody I'd like to go to, a country I'd never been to before, it'll be Richard Wise. And boy, was that a clever thing to have done. He was really a magnificent companion for traveling long distances. So two pretty tall chaps stuck in an airplane for sort of 14 hours. He was great because you could have a chat, but also he'd be very happy to be silent reading books. He was never intrusive. Somehow he knew when he needed to talk or when to be silent. And also, at the end of each day, you could say to each other, what on earth was that about? Um, so the Thai in Beijing was only really starting to becoming open for, for Westerners and foreigners. Um, and so it was all, of course, pre-Olympic. Um, and so we had these great tours around. They took us around to things as well. We were constantly chaperoned. You weren't allowed to go anywhere by yourself, although we did sneak off. Uh, it, Richard would have done it by himself, but with me, we were definitely sneaking off. Um, the other thing I was extremely grateful for to him for is even then, there was terrible smog. So I arrived with a chest infection. It's the worst chest infection I've ever had ever since. I had to have double antibiotics when I came back. This, you can't see it, is the Imperial City because the smog was so bad. Um, so it was completely beautiful, but you could barely see it. Um, and Richard was very, very caring because I was coughing away really dreadfully, had a terrible temperature. He was constantly kind of looking after me at the same time as trying to negotiate the science and the uh, cultural things. Um, one of the things I discovered when I start going through these ancient photographs is A, uh, digital cameras in 2002 don't have very high pixel counts. And the second is Richard and I flatly refused to ever have our photograph taken. So um, the only one I've got is Richard's hidden here. <laughs> this lady here was our, one of our long-suffering postdocs that was being dragged around with us everywhere. And she dutifully, wherever we were, was saying, would you like your photograph taken? And of course we said, no, no, we couldn't possibly. We're English, we're gentlemen, we don't take photographs of ourselves. And of course now I regret it, because um, that's the only one I have of Richard and me, I think, in China. Um, 
our long suffering, this long suffering postdoc also had to suffer from us being slightly adventurous. So we were taken, of course, to the Great Wall, and we're here we are in the um, car park. And it's really set up for you to basically get to here, which is here, and then possibly, if you really must, go to here. And so the postdoc grudgingly walked up a part of the way. And of course, Richard and I, that was really not enough. So um, we left her behind. She was breaking the rules because she was supposed to chaperone us everywhere. And we said, don't worry, well, we can't get off, can we? We've got to come back past you, so it's, please just sit down. We also left the soldiers behind. Um, so this is the last soldiers we saw. Um, and we decided that there were going to be good photographs. Um, those of you that have been, or those you haven't, it's extremely steep. They just built it straight up the mountain. Um, and so that didn't, inter didn't stop us, nor my chest infection, um, to get some better photos. So you can see, this is the car park. Um, the postdoc is somewhere down here. Um, and eventually, you get to these sorts of photographs. Probably you can't see that so well. Um, but we went so far that actually the paving runs out, those of you who've ever been. So they just pave and make the first bit look nice. But if you keep walking, eventually the wall's there, but there's no paving. So we would have carried on, but you just couldn't, I think that we, you were barred from carrying on any further. But we managed to get some fantastic photographs up there. And the second thing was, of course, we discovered quite quickly that we both love photography. Um, we both had experience of probably things you shouldn't do, but having your hands in fixer for hours in the darkroom, um, we were perfectly happy to do that, uh, despite the probably uh, consequences to ourselves. And um, we would share photographs. I'll see Richard was a great photographer of many things, particularly street photography, which I very much admired because I'd never done it. And I did different things. And we would um, bore each other to death while with other people about photographs, swapping photographs and other things that we did with them. So we would constantly switch photographs to each other. Um, and like others have said, and you probably recognize some of these, I guess, those you've had cars from Richard uh, with um, fantastically libelous things in the inside. And we would share photographs of very different kinds and, and, and very much enjoy them. Um, and just to finish, of course, this is Richard Wise. So um, something I, I've never been able to do, but he did marvelously with his uh, street photographs, is there was always that slightly um, cheeky um, uh, form of photography, and he would capture the most great street scenes, uh, which we all um, love and admire him for, including this one. You read that? Yeah. Um, just in case you can't see it, it says, I'm just doing this to pick up chicks, because chicks dig a man who holds up a sign. <laughs> and the fact is, caught, captured it so beautifully, but found that one I thought was extremely uh, typical of Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. So we're on the home straight now. Last, but very much not least, is uh, Fatima. Um, one of Richard's or Richard's last PhD shoot? Uh, uh, penultimate. Penultimate Sour, PhD Sour shoot. Was the last one. Um, so very close to Richard and has been the main organiser for the, for the meeting. So thanks very much, Fatima. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? I first met Richard in an interview room for an academic clinical fellowship position in 2008. He was wearing his characteristic bow tie and smile, as we've heard today. Over the following 10 years, Richard became a supportive PhD supervisor, valuable mentor, and a cherished friend. For me, this was a very happy decade that I shared with other fellows and PhD students. Oh, this is on doing its own work. If it runs over, we'll just carry on. Um, many of whom are here today or watching the live streaming. I wanted to start with this photo, still here, it's good, as it summarizes the atmosphere of the Richard Lab that Richard created for all of us. A fun place to pass time with friends, with the vast proportion of it spent in his office engaging in fascinating conversations, which range from science, mentorship, 
humorous anecdotes, Shakespeare and photography, as we've heard. He was a fantastic supervisor. He gave a great sense of autonomy to students, whilst providing valuable support when required. He would sit enthusiastically for hours alongside his fellows, looking at brain activation data on a computer monitor, asking him or her to upload activation map after activation map after activation map. He would then pause, think, and ask the student to navigate to a precise anatomical coordinate. Now go to minus 58, minus 28, the coordinate for the left plane in temporale. Or try minus 48, minus 52, 38, the left angular gyrus. The millimeter precision of his anatomical knowledge was incredibly impressive and a reflection of his intelligence. I learned a lot from Richard during these sessions, not least that many blobs of activity we see is just noise. When I first joined Richard's lab, he was beginning to move away from localization view of cognitive functions, what he jokingly would call phrenological descriptions, to a more distributed network-based account of these functions. So together with Robert Leach and Professor Christian Beckman, who was at Imperial at the time, we published a series of articles in Healthy Controls and Patients with Stroke, describing the overlapping nature of distributed brain networks that support speech production. This line of thinking also led to a series of brain papers that attributed language recovery after stroke, at least in part, to function of domain general brain networks. Richard was a prolific writer. He had a particular style of writing that we all became familiar with. One of the roles of the first author for his papers was to tone down his colorful, witty, and frank accounts that could be a direct challenge to some in the field. He had a notable dislike of using specific words when writing about his work. These included vital, critical, and crucial. To me, this was a reflection of his modesty about his own discoveries. As well as an academic, Richard was an astute neurologist who the Hammersmith Neurology Registrars could always count on if they encountered a complex case. He was clinically very supportive of the junior doctors. He had a great sense of empathy, including with his patients. He went out of his way to help me with a cachectic and frail middle-aged Afghan refugee who had lost his swallowing abilities and had been transferred from Wormwood Scrub Prison next door to Hammersmith Hospital. Richard examined the patient who was still shackled to a prison guard sitting by his bed. He confirmed my suspicions that this was a case of motor neuron disease with frontotemporal dementia. It was clear to him that this was a miscarriage of justice and that, had he, that he had ended up in prison because his frontotemporal dementia had not been diagnosed and not been taken into account in court. His view was that this would not be the case if this patient was more resourceful and able to afford a decent legal team. He wrote several letters to the prison governor, building the case to keep the patient out of prison and in hospital in his last remaining months. I would like to end on this photo, which was taken in January when a group of us got together to celebrate Richard's 68th birthday. Although he had finished a course of chemotherapy, he insisted on walking with us back to King's Cross Station to go to John Lewis in Oxford Street to purchase a few items. I feel truly honored to have known Richard, who has been a great source of inspiration for me. I have learned a